As I said in the intro, I'm using Vera wood to make this plane. It's an ideal wood for plane making just because it's, you know, hard, dense, and stable. I'll actually link the lumber yard in the description that I got from. I begin the process by milling it up and then cutting it to length. Vera is a tropical hardwood, and some of the characteristics that make these types of uh, hardwoods unique are that they have interlocking grain, they're also really hard and waxy. Um, one of the most special things about this wood though is the aroma that it makes when you're milling it up. It's like this very sweet, spicy kind of very unique scent that it's, it's unbelievable. It, it leaves your shop smelling incredible. I'm going to use one of my old planes to get the general dimensions of the new one. Um, so I just mark it up. I, I believe the length, the rough length I'm cutting it at is at about 10 inches. For these planes you really want the grain to be quarter sawn from the sole. So if you take a look right here, um, I'm trying to figure out the top and bottom of my plane. So right here this is what I want. I want the grain quarter sawn to rift from the sole. And I'm also going to feel the grain and see which direction it's going. Uh, and from there, make my cabinet maker's mark to give me the orientation of the front, back, and sides of the plane. Before you start cutting it up, though, you want to make sure you have your plane iron size. So this is going to be for an inch and three quarter plane iron. Knowing that, then I can cut the cheeks of the plane. I'm cutting the cheeks to about five sixteenths to about three eighths. And then that will give me just over an inch and three quarter, about an inch and fifteen sixteenths in the center. And then right here you can see the, the wood is very stable. There was no movement when I cut it on the bandsaw at all. You should have about a sixteenth on each side of the plane iron for the center of the plane. The next step is to remove all the milling marks from the bandsaw. And because this wood is exotic, it's, it has that interlocking grain, and really the only way to do that is by scraping. I'm going to go ahead and scrape and check occasionally for flat using a straight edge. I want both my cheeks and the center of this plane to be completely dead flat. I need them dead flat because when I go to glue up the plane, I don't want to introduce any tension that would cause the plane to move over time. And so this shot you can see right here, you can't even see the seams, that's what you want. The next step in the process is to find my angles for the rear and forward ramp. So I'm going to start by marking the center of the center of the plane uh, and striking a line square from there. The next step is to find the angle for the rear ramp, and in this case it's 57 degrees. And that's why it's considered high angle, because generally uh, plane irons are bedded at about 45. So I'm going to strike that line, and then I'm going to move to the forward ramp, which has an angle of 60 degrees. This thing that I'm using has my 45 and 60 degree angles already cut into it, so I generally use these for plane making, but for this sake I'm going to just show you the process. So I'm going to strike that line at 60 degrees, and then just angle my bevel gauge to match that line, and you know, scribe that all the way through. And then right here, the X's just signify what's about to be cut out. You want to do your best to really try to hug those lines that you made. Uh, it, makes, it makes the cleanup of them just a little bit more easy. The forward ramp's a little different. You actually want to cut a slight curve into it, and the purpose of that is to allow shavings to escape a little bit easier. So. Initially, you know, you can see right here, I cut it straight on the line, but then I went back and cut a slight curve. And then the curve of the forward ramp is shown here. Next, we clean up the rear ramp. And this has to be completely flat and completely square. Um, this is what the plane iron is resting on. And if there's any chatter marks or dips or humps, the, the plane iron is going to see correctly. So you really want to have a low angle smoothing plane to do this process. Um, 
in, even on the low angle smoothing plane, you still kind of want to add a micro bubble to that. Um, it makes planing the end grain of this stuff a lot easier. You can actually have a little fun with the forward ramp. It's not as important. Um, you can either scrape it down, leave it smooth, leave it as is, or you can add just some gouge marks uh, like I did. But keep in mind, using your gouge on one of the hardest woods in the world is kind of a bear. I really do love the look of that. The next part's a little complicated. Uh, you want to take your forward ramp and plane it on your shooting board until you get about a, an eighth inch of flat on the front, I guess. Um, it'll make sense in the next couple of shots. And then you want to take your rear ramp and put it on the bevel, 57 degree bevel you made, and plane it from there. And so right here you can see you want the that bevel that you just made to match the bevel on the plane iron, and you also want the plane iron to be about a sixteenth up from the front uh, ramp. And right here I'm just marking where the bottom of the screw cap is, so I'm going to go make a slot for that to sit in. Next we're actually going to put the whole plane assembly together. So I want to match uh, the top of the uh, plane iron bevel with the rear ramp bevel and 16 up from the forward ramp um, from the floor and then just kind of clamp it together. So if you did that correctly then the plane iron should actually not be protruding from the sole of the plane. Once that's situated and clamped up we're ready to drill our locator dowels. So I'm going to use a 5 16 inch brad point uh, drill bit and drill on the top corners of both sides of the plane. And this allows us just to take the plane apart and put it back together and have everything line up exactly as we clamped it initially. Next we got to find the location of our cross pin. So I, I, I begin that by striking a line where the rear ramp meets the top and then I'll square down from that line. And then from there I'll grab my bevel gauge set to 57 degrees and connect the line from the bottom to the top. And that'll give us the, the rear ramp location. And from there uh, I'll actually grab that kind of template block that I used in the beginning and go from the bottom. The width of that is an inch and a quarter. So I strike that horizontally and that's going to give me the height of the cross pin. From there, I can grab my chip breaker and plane iron, place it on that rear ramp location that we uh, scribed first, and then grab this block again, which is also 5 16 of an inch. And that really represents the wedge of the whole assembly. Scribe that line and then the connecting line horizontally and at 57 degrees is going to give me the location of the cross pin. I know that was a lot, but once you see it, it, it makes a lot of sense. With the cross pin laid out, we can go to the drill press and drill a 5 16 inch hole all the way through. We want, we want to have a perfectly square hole. And to prevent any blowout uh, from the inside of the plane, we put that kind of triangular shape that we had cut out uh, from the forward and rear ramp just kind of back into the whole assembly. And that, that really supports any fibers underneath uh, from blowing out. I thought it'd be nice to use a different type of wood for the cross pin. I had grabbed some African black wood from just like a scrap pile bin for like seven bucks the last time I went to one of my favorite lumber yards. And uh, it's been sitting on my shelf for a while. I've been looking at it. It's not really big enough for anything except for like small cabinet poles or cross pins. So I figured now was the time to mill that up.
Now I've got to figure out the dimensions of the cross pin. So I want it slightly shorter than the width of the plane. So I'll just kind of roughly mark it and then I'm going to cut three of them at this size. I, I want to have a couple extras just in case I mess up one or two of them. From there, I'm gonna cut the shoulders of the cross pin. You know, I'm just gonna eyeball it, trying to center it up as best as I can, and then go to the go to the table saw with the saw blade, just sort of not too high but not too low, just enough so that I can see it and um, fit that cross pin into that um, space so that it slides easy, but it's not too sloppy. Next, I need to get the dimensions of the cheeks, so I'm just gonna place the cross pin over the the five sixteenths inch hole that I made and uh, just kind of moving back and forth and raise the height of the saw blade until I get you know, it just wider than that opening. And once that's established, I'll go ahead and cut the shoulders of both my cross pins, and then I'll go to my bandsaw and cut the cheeks. So the test cross pin that I made, I had cut a curve into the, into the tip of it that represents the, the cheeks of the cross pin, so I'll just kind of use that curve and put it into the, the bandsaw blade just until it, you know, it fits in there nicely. The tenons of the cross pin right now are square, but we have to fit them into the hole that we drilled. So to do that, we gotta make them a circle. I've got a file with a safe edge, and what that means is that there's no you know, cutting curves on one edge of this file. So I'm, I'm able to just kind of rest this on the shoulders of the cross pin and file away, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna cut anything. I start by just establishing four facets and then just working by dividing those facets in half and in half and then eventually I'll, I'll get to a nice circle. Uh, I'll also make sure to keep everything as square as possible. I don't want to veer off to one edge or the other. To give the cross pins a little bit of flair, I'm going to bevel the edges and kind of pillow the, the tips of them. So just kind of round them over a bit, give them a little more dimension, make them look not so flat, basically. I'm also going to countersink the outside of this crossman hole, you know, just to give it a little dimension as well. You'll know you have a good fit for your crosspin when you clamp it up and it can rotate freely. We just have a little bit more shaping to do on it, so I'm just going to kind of create a little bit of a triangle on the top of this cross pin and I'm going to use my jointer plane to start making some facets and then I'll finish up with my files.
With the crossbin done, we can prep for glue up. And the first step in that is to wax the interior corners of the plane. We don't want any glue squeeze out to interfere with any part of the plane iron. So we, you know, we wax the interior corners and that prevents any glue from sticking to any wood. So when the, when the squeeze out occurs, we can just go in with a tool and scrape it out. I'll also link the wax in the description. Because Vera is actually very waxy, we need to scrape the cheeks and the interior of the plane body uh, to help the glue bond a little bit better. And then we'll also follow that up with an acetone wipe down. The glue up is actually pretty straightforward. The only thing you got to remember 100% without a doubt is just don't glue it up without the cross pin in the plane. You're also going to want to use some clamping calls to distribute the clamping pressure more evenly. The final step is just to check and make sure that your crossbin is still moving freely uh, once it's glued up, and if it is, you're golden. A random tool that's actually pretty useful is one of those dental scraper things. They really help you get into a weird corners and areas so um, you can see how easy that glue is just removed from those interior corners because we applied the wax. Now it's time to figure out the wedge. Uh, I've cut this piece at five degrees and it's also about five sixteenths of an inch thick. Um, so from there I'll just go ahead and grab that triangle piece that we had cut out from the body uh, in initially and shape my uh, wedge from there. Another brewer that I highly recommend is Sketchbook, uh, based out of Evanston, Illinois. So if you're in the Chicagoland area, I would check them out. I'll then assemble the plane and tap the wedge in to put it under pressure. I'll keep that iron up a little bit and then run it over the joiner just so I can square off the whole body. All right, now the fun part, we can start to shape the plane. Um, I'm gonna go from the top of the cross pin and measure about 5 16 to 3 8 And I don't wanna go below that line. Below that line, you start to get a little, little weak. So from there, I can just kinda trace out any shape I feel like. Since Vera is just so hard, I'm going to use the bandsaw just to kind of refine the shape a little bit and make it fit my hand. Another perk of using the bandsaw is that the marks it leaves are actually kind of rough and it, it leaves ridges. So it, it, it improves the grip overall of, of the plane. Um, aesthetically, I kind of like the rough look a little bit more. I'm This is it for the plane for me. I'm not going to go back, apply finish. I'm not going to go back and sand anything down. The bandsaw marks is the final 
finish basically for this plane. Alright, so the final task of this uh, whole operation is to flatten the sole. I've got some sticky back sandpaper, I believe it's 180 grit, and I apply it to any flat cast iron surface I have in the shop, and in this case it's the tabletop to my table saw. And I'll go ahead and slide the slide the plane, you know, front and back, trying to keep even pressure. I, I, I keep my hands around the cross pin just to kind of keep it in the middle. And then I'll go ahead with my straight edge and check for any gaps on light. And this is pretty important. You want it to be dead flat. The setup for these types of planes is also pretty straightforward. I put my, my plane iron and chip breaker in. I'll slide my wedge in and then I'll just tap the wedge in with my, uh, with my hammer uh, lightly just to kind of set it. And then I'll start making adjustments from there. I think the best part about tool making and play making is that you actually get to use it. You know, it's it's one of the most satisfying things I think you can do in woodworking, and um, you know, especially when you get nice, nice thin, full length, full width shavings. And the surface quality is pretty good. Those those ray that ray fleck, you know, there was no tear out in that. Nice glassy surface. It's a good plane, man. All right, well, that's it for the video. I, I appreciate y'all watching. Um, take care.